chicken. Oh, squiggly, we start skimming here. Young clap. <laughs> oh, that was good stuff. <laughs> I can't do no small talk. No, no small talk. I'm not with the small talk. Can't be with the small talk. So I'm sitting here with Akona Klokeni. Akona, did I? Yes, perfect. Yes, because I practiced <laughs> so much this morning. Akona Klokeni. Perfect. <laughs> um, environmentalist and climate activist, youth activist. And we've actually known each other for quite a while. We go way back to university days, Stellenbosch University, same residence. And I remember back then you already strike me as a leader, someone that I that I noticed. You were passionate about everything you took on. I remember um, the environment were, was already something you were very passionate about back then. Mm-hmm. You also completed your master's in environmental management at Stellenbosch University. Yes. And you have gone on to do amazing things. I mean, I actually needed notes to to <laughs> make sure that I get all of the things correct that you've actually achieved. Um, you were at the at the G20 Youth Summit last year, if that's yes. if I remember correctly. Um, you were one of the two hundred the male and guardians, two uh, young two hundred male and guardian, the one of the yes, the two hundred young leaders exactly. <laughs> and it, the list goes on and on. Just tell us about. A corner, you know the things you are doing. Um, some of your career highlights. Um, hi, Miley, and <laughs> thanks for having me here I'm just today. Jumping in, <laughs> I know, I know, we've been planning this for a very long time, mm-hmm. so I'm glad it's finally come, and it's nice to talk with someone I'm familiar with, so you kind of know my journey as well. Um, so yeah, I think people always like are trying to look for like a profound moment of like how they got where they are. But I think with me, it's literally just been like my personality and following what I'm enjoying or like what I'm passionate about. So even going back to where I grew up. So I come from Gondle, the formerly known as King Williamstown in the mm-hmm. Eastern Cape, a small town there. And that's basically where I grew up for 18 years of my life. I stayed in the same homes that I was like born into and with the same community, same kind of friends, same school, was in the same school for 13 years since, you know, grade R to matric. So I was familiar with the environment, but I feel like I always had a sense of I wanted to go somewhere else out there. I feel, I've always felt like there was something out there because I think I had an inquisitive mind and I did um, history as a subject. And obviously there was now social media and television. So mm. you could see everything else happening out there. But I couldn't really pinpoint like a career passion at that time. I remember like in primary school, I changed careers all the time. <laughs> at some point I was going to be a hairdresser. like, And then I wanted to be a baker. Then I wanted to be like an actress and then I wanted to be a doctor. So I kept like changing and going as um, I had an inclination. So I followed my inclination every time. But then the one thing which was always consistent was my like feeling for social justice. So even when I was growing up and seeing poverty and seeing inequality, and I think the history aspect of it came about in high school, but when you were still doing like social sciences and you would kind of see like what happened to our country and obviously, excuse me, when I went to my granny's house, you see like there's something off, but I couldn't pinpoint what was off. So I would go to my community at home and then go to my granny's place and then go to school and those communities weren't the same. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really pinpoint like the whole racial component because my school was predominantly black people, even though it was a formerly white school. So I couldn't separate, okay, no, I see people of my color and I see young, I was in an all girls school as well. So I see the same gender. So I couldn't pinpoint what this injustice was, but I knew that there was something I was passionate about. So that's where the volunteering started, doing a lot of outreach work, volunteering with a lot of orphanages in in the town, old age homes. So We'd had what is, I think, internationally it's known as a Rotary Club, but for us it was called an Interact Club. So it basically had different components of sustainability, like similar to the MGD in, in Stellenbosch. Oh, yes, the, our community yes, service, our community service. Components. Yeah, so it's, it, it's kind of separated into like economic, not sorry, <laughs> environmental and sustainability and more social and outreach and community. So it was a similar um, kind of school club that I joined. And that's when I also started hearing people's stories. So I love stories and I love podcasts. I love reading. I love, 
you know, watching documentaries because I think that's the best way to learn about people. So that's where then the whole social justice thing came from. Then it started pushing me to want to actually do a career in that. So then my career choices were like law to social work to um, what was the other one? Yeah, but I kept changing careers. <laughs> Every time we had to do a job sharing project, it was on a different yeah, career path. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but I always knew that it was something in the social justice area. So when I chose a degree path in, in Stellenbosch, I chose social dynamics because um, that obviously gave me a very diverse background of different subjects and or modules they're mm-hmm. called um to choose from so i chose psychology sociology english public and development management and psychology sociology public development, english f- oh philosophy and then there's obviously com- compulsory computer mo- mm. a computer module and then Every year, I would just do a process of elimination according to my passions. And to figure out, like, where where am I taking this? Yes. I have so many things I'm passionate about. Like, how am I going to turn this into a career? Yes, because I think I was always struggling with the whole kind of too many options, mm. if I can put it that way. I, I believe in chasing all my passions mm. and options. And obviously, sometimes it comes to a det- it comes at a detriment to my progress or it frustrates me because I'm doing too many things. But then... I, I knew all of those kind of modules would work to my advantage. The philosophy was kind of like the critical thinking mm-hmm. and opening up um, how I view myself and the world, kind of like that interchangeably exploration of things. Sociology was more of like the macro issues we are facing as a country and internationally. And then psychology was kind of like the mind and like mental health. So that's where I started getting very passionate about mental health. So by the time I, I got to house committee, then I kind of faulted um, up my my passions or mm. my interests. So I had chosen public and development management because I thought I was going to do public administration and work in government, etc. And then next I was, president. Ooh, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the psychology. I was always passionate about the mental health and cognitive health of people and myself because it was also an opportunity to learn about myself and my personality traits and my genetics and what I inherited and not. So I always psychoanalyze myself, unfortunately. And then the macro issues. So day zero happens. Um, as soon as I get into a um, house committee, day zero happens in Cape Town. And then it was my portfolio. And then now we were told as a residence, we need to organize these programs to adapt to the kind of Western Cape droughts which are coming or which had been kind of coming in as we were going. And that's when the environmental stuff picked up. So the environmental stuff, as you said, um, earlier I always had it in me mm. so it's like similar to the social stuff so in the school club there were environmental components litter um, drives we had recycling bins and projects we had all these eco-friendly kind of solutions that young people were presenting and obviously I also learned from home like my mom and my granny sustainability I always say is a lifestyle so when you looked at um, my grandmother she was kind of doing more household farming so it wasn't kind of like commercial or anything it was just for sustaining her and her family um she would do kind of compost she'd make her own compost oh, wow. she would reuse and recycle you know um containers and products she was always kind of like farming like this whole vegan or um vegetarian movement she was doing it this plant-based lifestyle she was mm. doing it as kind of an organic thing it wasn't kind of this buzz fancy sustainability yeah. thing it was like a lifestyle for her and yeah, so I learned about all of those things and kind of water saving, electricity saving when we already were growing up at home. So by the time it became this crisis we are facing now, I had already had kind of kind of the the knowledge of um, how to approach it. So by the time Day Zero came, um, we had to implement a lot of measures in our residence. And, you know, it's quite a lot of young women mm-hmm. and from different backgrounds. So you must kind of be very careful about how you approach it and be sensitive to the yeah. subject because... I remember we had a critical conversation the one time about the whole water shortage, telling people um, how to save water, etc. And then someone p- put up their hand and they said, I'm from a, d- a disadvantaged background and we don't even have running water. Sure. So your conversation is not even relevant to me when you're talking about swimming pools and not watering your lawns and using this much water in the shower or, you know, in the buckets. We have a water tank. That's what she said. We have a water tank that we rely on and obviously... Um, maybe um, a water truck will come every now and then or you go to the river. But basically the conversation was then a different conversation. Mm -hmm. We had to look at the social components of it. 
so yeah, then the day zero kind of became a, a bigger th- ch- challenge that I wanted to tackle because I always realized that every social or human rights challenge has an underlying environmental component attached to it. Okay. So in order to make sure that people's human rights and kind of, yeah, the, the human rights and the social mm-hmm. justice is met, you have to make sure that the environmental components are catered for. So that's how I became me. And, and that then, like led you to doing your master's in yes, environmental in management. Yeah. And, you know, what, what does the job look like? Like the type of job opportunities you have? Um, how did you... How did you decide, okay, environmental management it is, and how did you see your career? Like, what was your thinking behind that? Um, I think, actually, it's crazy. Like I said, I thought I was going to do public administration. So I thought, you know, service delivery is the closest way to see impact. So if I work in, let's say, Department of Water and Sanitation or Environmental Affairs, and then you work on policies and maybe you go do field trips, then you kind of see the impact. So you'll know in the office this decision was made and we're on the ground and we're seeing the impact. We're counting how many people get water tanks. Mm. But then when I was somehow doing my honours and masters in environmental management, diplomacy became a thing. So I started doing a lot of work with the embassies through the South African Institute for International Affairs. So I was a student volunteer for them. And um, I also did UNASA on campus, Mm -hmm. which is the United Nations Association for Students. And then that spiraled into a whole diplomacy conversation of this bigger movement of how can we as young people get access to our leaders Mm. to talk about these issues. Because I know around 2018, around day day zero, 2019, the climate conversation hadn't been begun. I think Greta, the Greta movement began September of 2019. And that's when a lot of young people kind of jumped onto the bandwagon. So I didn't like specifically say this is that direction I'm going. So I just started doing a lot of diplomacy stuff while doing honors and masters. And then at some point, I realized that I was getting a lot of freelancing opportunities. So while I was doing that, someone would say, maybe we want you to come and do a public speaking gig. And then I started doing op-eds for the Mail and Guardian. And that just spiraled into more freelance work. Because by the time you get to masters, it's a very tricky space of you overly qualified, but mm. underexperienced. So it was a whole thing of how do I then find the best way to navigate, you know, internships sometimes underpay mm. you, but then you also underexperienced to mm. get a kind of entry level, you know, job. So that's where the, the kind of the path took me. So once I started getting more opportunities and they were paying and it's freelance, started navigating that journey then into more freelance work. And then now it's kind of partnering with different partners from international and different embassies to more South African organizations and working with them. And yeah, that's basically I mean, because you've crazy worked job. with <laughs> many embassies, you've traveled overseas, um, you're a public speaker, you do this all the time, <laughs> speaking about, you know, the effects of climate change, global warming. I mean, is it not daunting? You're, you're 25 years old <laughs> and you are, I mean, you're the Greta, I never know how to pronounce her say name. Greta. Some say Thunberg, some yeah, say is it, Thunberg. We need to, we need to <laughs> investigate. Is it Thunberg, Thunberg? But yeah. I mean, you basically, for me, you are basically the South African version of her. You are young, you speak out on these challenges we are facing. I mean, do you think we are taking it seriously enough? And when it comes to, I know it's become a buzzword, we talk Mm -hmm. about global warming more, but are we actually taking it seriously enough, Um, especially us as the youth? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, with the Greta thing, I always say I'm very skeptical about putting a face on the movement because different people Mm. have different challenges and they relate differently to climate change. So I think when we're trying to have South African celebrities, if I can put it that way, it's it's very scary because then a certain few are getting opportunities and access rather Mm. than other people. And I always say, even though I am like always in the forefront of the movement, I always want to kind of shine light on the people who actually have the daily impact. So people like the KZ from the KZN floods or the day zero droughts in Port Elizabeth, Kabecha now. Um, So yeah, I think just about kind of correcting that part is, yeah, I I am one of the many Mm. young people contributing and it's a privilege to still also get opportunities and be recognized. And I think the youth is taking it quite seriously. Um, I think it's like that whole thing where 
each generation goes through a challenge that they, it, they pick up on. And I think it's always like your circumstances force you. So I know with our parents, it was apartheid and there was colonization before that. And the fourth industrial revolution is coming now. I think each, um, they call it, I think, socio-metabolic um, eras. So there was kind of the hunter-gatherer phases, then it was kind of the farming phases, then it was the industrial revolution. And I think now we're going into what's called the sustainability epoch. So it's kind of like a transition into this whole idea of how do we live sustainably? Um, how do we have sustainable economies? You know, the social sector and then in the environmental sector now is part of that. And I think with young people, I think it's just kind of like a natural generational push which has forced us to think about mm -hmm. this because I think we are so inclined to think about the future generations. We are inclined to think about our frustrations. I know these are more intersectional with other issues as well. So sometimes when people think about climate change, they think about water, then you think about gender rights and then some think about disability rights, some think about racial rights. And I think it's also quite intersectional to look at it that way. I think people come from different entry points and I think it's 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 something we shouldn't discredit when other people prioritize, for example, meatless Mondays, while others pr prioritize the kind of fashion industry, and then others look at more um, agriculture and how you you know you farm. Because I think people are being pushed by what they're passionate about, mm -hmm. and you've seen a lot of young people kind of being very. Um, very kind of like um, they're advocating out loud what they're passionate about and they're speaking to mm -hmm. their leaders and they're trying to get into those rooms and into those spaces. But I think what is also a challenge as a young person is the whole tokenism thing. How do you manage being in the rooms but for the right reasons and also knowing that you will have the impact you're looking for? And that's a hard thing to navigate. I'm also still struggling with that because it's a it's it goes um, against sometimes your, your personal values or ethics. So you must always be evaluating, am I doing this for the right reason, for the right communities? And like, for example, I mentioned, sometimes it's not about me. So if it's a documentary and they're asking for a young person um, who is affected by climate change, I can't lie and make up a story and mm. say, oh, way back when. I, I have to find another person who has a, a more pressing issue with maybe a flood taking away their home and shine the light on them rather than making it about me. But I think we are trying as young people. Obviously, a lot of work needs to still be done. And I think we also must make use of young professionals because mm -hmm. I think we always think it's just excuse me, the people who can speak well, who should, you know, be leading the movement. But there are people who are in these spaces, the people who work for government, the people who work for the private sector. So I think those young people in those spaces can also make mm. a big difference if they're elevated. And But I think the thing is, if you are well versed, then <laughs> you people do tend to navigate to those people because yeah. they, they are able to, um, to put what they are thinking into words more effectively. Um, so just taking it back to, you mentioned tokenism. Yeah. Let's break that down. What, what exactly do you mean when you say that? So it's when um, people in leadership do tick box exercises. So it's when um, you're trying to cater for a certain, you know, the, the, the world is looking for a certain, you know, group of people to be represented, but you're not doing it intentionally to invest in those people. So oh. for example, if, um, it's like how we had laws after apartheid, like the BEE and the triple BEE, mm. to make sure that people get into certain spaces. But then now we need to take it a step further and make sure that those people actually get impact and you know influence in those spaces, can make an, an impact and influence in those spaces. So if you're having a young person in a room of adults, are they feeling intimidated? Are they allowed to speak? Are they allowed to, you know follow through with the process is it just for that day or are they invited back are they contributing to the bigger conversations do you exclude them after that so i mm. think that's what kind of tokenism works as is you kind of tick the, the box and then you maybe take a nice picture and you say we did consult the youth because uh, i actually wanted to sorry for interrupting you now but that's okay. i was actually wondering you know these spaces that you occupy it must be very intimidating mm -hmm. um do you feel like you get taken seriously in these spaces you when you talk to world leaders mm -hmm. um people that are much older than you um white men sometimes <laughs> um a lot of the times so for me that would be so intimidating um do you feel like how have you learned to navigate those spaces and do you feel like you get taken seriously um i think i started picking up a passion, well, it was an interest, through the orphanages and speaking to older people. I think 
unintentionally, I, pil- I built a skill or picked up a skill to talk to older people without knowing it. So by the time I got to the kind of more formal spaces where it was like about talking about serious stuff, I think I had been used to talking to adults. I always say I gravitate to adults more in conversations, even <laughs> like at family events. Like it's just so like the wisdom I get from them. So I always would take it as a learning experience. But then I won't lie and say it's easy when you get into spaces where you have to fight for an idea or a belief that you have. So in those spaces, sometimes it is it does get maybe condescending or patronizing a bit where you feel like, OK, this is not what you should be saying to me. Or we like you saying the obvious sometimes like, oh, young people should. Are we glad you're here? Like, or, you know, people mm. just kind of fluff the whole idea of your presence. But I think. Um, it, it's it's quite challenging as a young black woman mm. um, to always kind of make yourself feel, you know, that you belong. Because I think even before we talk about how other people make you feel, the imposter syndrome is quite sure. real. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> Your own personal like Doubting challenges yourself, and doubts yeah. and questioning, mm. should I even be here? Whether you have the qualifications and experience or not, those still creep in. Definitely. And then the whole thing of do you speak well and eloquently? So it's a whole thing that's also like, you know, people look out for how do you pronounce words mm. and all of that. So that's what I'm saying. It's also like a whole internal struggle that you have. And then it's, it's do you have the expertise? But sometimes you find that you actually are quite qualified to be in those spaces. So then it's, it's also just about then how do you make sure that you toe the line to get your points across, but not ruffle the feathers too much that no one wants to have you again Mm. so you must kind of find that balance where i can still get my points across i can use the right tone you know not sound sound too offensive and angry and whatever but also i can still you know make them feel like i'm not intimidating and Mm. threatening and yeah so it's, it's it's a struggle and it's a balance i'm also still trying to work through but i've found it that sometimes i've been able to learn how to balance that by working through the embassies. So when I worked through the embassies, it kind of, I was a youth ambassador for the Justin Green transition for the Danish embassy for sure. a year or more than a year, 18 months and working closely with um, Ambassador Tobias. Wait, so um, just to break that down, what, what <laughs> I mean, those are all big words for okay. me. What exactly um, did you do? Okay, so what did the job ba- entail? Basically, um, I think it was twenty twenty one. So the Danish embassy opened up a youth kind of advocate slash mm-hmm. ambassador role for the green and just transition. So that role basically is to have a young South African incorporated into the embassy's kind of structure for a year or more than a year, from in my case, and then learn about the Danish policies and practices that they're trying to work through with the energy transition and the green transition. So kind of overall in the water sector, energy sector, agriculture sector, and then also then balance with the South African practices and policies and what's happening in South Africa, and then kind of like advocate um, for the South African voice, but in spaces. So it's the, it's a platform that they gave me to learn about the Danish ways. So I had an experience of going to Denmark with a water delegation and learning about how water practices are done there, that the Department of Water and Sanitation was also there. And we visited a couple of municipalities there. And then you also, it's kind of like an inter- cultural experience which we got and then um there's a component of then attending ministers high level uh, meetings with the ambassador sorry so then he would like bring you with and like if you feel kind of a bit intimidated or shy he would like bring it up that you're in the room introduce it to everyone and it's quite like high level people like the director generals and ministers at some time and he would like make he was very intentional even the deputy high head of mission um Jacob Stenstall, Stenstall would also like be intentional about trying to bring up my voice. So they would constantly ask, Akona, do you have anything to add? What do you think about this? And they pre- prepared me also to speak up to people who might be a bit intimidating. So they also had gave me a bit of access into our, our leaders. So indirectly, because it's so hard to get um, access to our leaders. When they were at the table, then I was able to bring all the voices um, from the young South Africans, all the 
um, stories, all the challenges that we are also concerned about to those tables. So, and then obviously they encouraged me to write op-eds and to kind of like um, facilitating roles, kind of like sharpen my other skills. So facilitating um, different discussions, like a youth day discussion or conversation we had. So that's what the kind of role entailed. Sure. Um, and, you know, we've spoken now about imposter syndrome and mm-hmm. the pressure we put on ourselves. Do you feel like um, you have a certain responsibility, you know, as, um, you know, I'm just thinking if I listen to this, it, it sounds like you're doing amazing things. And with that comes pressure. Do you feel like you have a certain responsibility to... Um, to advocate for the youth um, or have you learned to manage that and just do your thing? Yeah, no, the pressure's there and people make it very obvious that the pressure's there sometimes. Oh, really? Because I always thought that, I don't know, maybe television kind of like messed our perception a bit, but I always thought that maybe there'll be like a feeling when you kind of get there or you get to a certain milestone. So I always would say to people, but no, I want to wait until I'm at a certain age because I think it's because of the documentaries and the I'm books. I'm also like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not good I'm enough not now. Ready yeah, <laughs> not ready. I'll, I'll be ready whenever and that yep. time never comes. You just yep. need to dive in. So I would always like have like all these milestones of no, this age or this time but then I started realizing that people actually are watching whether or not you believe that you're ready or not Mm -hmm. so let's say after you're done with high school university or any milestone you've you know accomplished people are watching and they look up to you so once I started getting like the dms or people will follow and say something or they invite you to do something and like there's these kind of like upcoming projects that I'm looking into with like people asking me to be on boards of stuff (gasps) for me that's scary and I'm like but it's also amazing yeah and they're like no but we think you're ready and we know you are and we believe in you and we believe in the message you have to share and that's when I started realizing okay I might have a bit of a responsibility but also I still want to be so true to myself Mm. so even though I'm still kind of speaking up for issues and challenges that we're facing but I also don't want it to make me chase some fame or celebrity you know idea of who I should be but I think I'm trying to balance that I'm being myself and also still kind of representing the movement and yeah it's a challenge because sometimes you want to equip people to do it for themselves so you want to go to that young girl in the disadvantaged and impoverished community and teach them how to speak proper English or try to just communicate their and express their thoughts so that it's not always you being like everyone's mouthpiece because I don't know everyone's story and I can't relate all the time. So I'd rather sometimes find ways to equip other people. So I think the whole board idea might be actually useful sometimes just to kind of like filter through an organization how to help other people rather than me always kind of having to just do the work but that's or a, be the face. And that's actually something that always strikes me about you. You never make it about yourself, you know. Um, yes, you've traveled the world for all of these conferences and discourses, but it's never about you. You try and you stick to the core. You mm. stick to what you're passionate about. Um, it's about the environment, vulnerable groups, social justice. I mean, how, how do you... Where does that come from, that humility... Um, you know, standing up for other people. Is that just a corner or was that something in your life that struck you as, okay, but I need to, yeah. you know, where, where does that come from? I actually don't know. Now that you're mentioning <laughs> it, that may, maybe I can start thinking about it more. But I think, um, I know this whole Gen Z, Millen Z, whatever thing. Yeah, people <laughs> think we're quite young. But um, I think for me, it was a thing of, I grew up in a time where, Social media wasn't big. And from my small town, there weren't that many celebrities that I knew of. So I think it wasn't always a thing of chasing fame for me because I didn't associate fame with my lived reality. Mm -hmm. Yes, now and then you'd hear, oh, so-and-so made it. They're in Joburg and they're doing very well in the Cape Town overseas. But it wasn't a thing of I could mirror the fame Mm -hmm. element of followers and, you know, a whole TV crew following you or like reality TV. So I think for me, that's what also made it just about the issues and the core. And also I don't like attention. (laughs) Like, and I struggle (laughs) hearing my voice sometimes and watching myself. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that's why I just divert the, the attention most of the time, because I feel like sometimes you will kind of get the limelight 
indirectly. So you don't need to chase it and kind of intentionally seek it. By you just doing the work, it will come. Mm -hmm. And whether you like it or not, then you can navigate how you balance that. But I think for me, also the people I grew up around, my mom, my grandmother, like all the women who are very kind of um, important in my life growing up, they weren't about kind of the credentials or the accreditation or, you know, what they get out of it. So my mom was a teacher and she did it for the teaching job. Yes, she got the accolades and obviously got mm. the, the benefits of the job, but she was passionate about the teaching. So I think that's when I learned you need to first find your passion, do that very well. And I know this whole black excellence thing is a thing is a controversial thing because sometimes it's used in a toxic positivity way where people are being forced to just work hard and be a strong black woman and it's exhausting sometimes. But yeah, I think I still believe in in it to some extent, which is kind of like where you draw the line to before crossing po toxic positivity. I still believe that you can strive for excellence and do well in what you believe in. And then all the other things are just going to come falling afterwards. And you mentioned black excellence now. Um, you know, I've wondered, do you, do you experience some challenges as a young black female in the spaces you occupy, mm -hmm. you know, those aren't spaces where where people like you were traditionally, you know, given a voice. So yeah. um, what are some of the challenges that you feel comes with that? Yeah, I think um, this might go back to when I was applying for house committee. I had the whole speech you have to say in front of the residents. And I remember speaking about like a smarty box. I don't know why. It was that time when checkers had the mini grocery, like uh, little, yes. <laughs> little, um, little like toys. And then I had that um, from one shopping day. And I looked at it and I was like, I, th I started thinking about how did I make it to Stellenbosch? And we know Stellenbosch is like a challenging place to mm. live in as a young black person. I feel, yeah. I mean, that was also, sorry to interrupt you, but... Yeah. That was kind of where I also learned a lot, you know, mm. well, had to learn and unlearn a lot of things that I wasn't even aware of, you yeah. know, the white privilege talks and all of mm. those things that came up. And I was like, wow, you it, it really it opened so many conversations and doors to me. But sorry, I interrupted you now. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad you <laughs> can to you. Back, back <laughs> to you. Yeah, so I think um, I, I started asking myself because I remember getting a lot of advice and lessons of don't go to Stellenbosch, mm -hmm. actually, when I was in matric. And then I, I had this thing of I really want to go to Stellenbosch, but I think I wanted just a small town, like a student community yeah, vibe. Yeah. So it was either Stellenbosch or Rhodes as my second option because I, st I still wanted the small town community vibe. But then Stellenbosch, I think for me, I wanted to really push against my my norm so like I said I grew up in a small town mm. with predominantly black people around me yes in school my teachers were predominantly white and there were like a lot of white um, peers in my grade and in other grades but I think when I went to Stellenbosch I was like I want to kind of break the status quo mm. I don't know why I wanted to break the status quo for my family I wanted to eliminate the fear for other people for my community and family members who believe that um you can't go there. And then it was that kind of also crucial time when um, I think it was Laster, that video which which yes. kind of blew up in Still and Wash was happening. And the, the language policy changed 2015 just before we, we got there. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, so it started in Stellenbosch. I think Stellenbosch prepared me for the world. Mm. Like you said, the critical conversations we had to have, when incidents happened, yeah. we always went back to our reses and you had like a roommate you could chat to about. And I am one of my best friends also is kind of... Um, She's not kind of. She is. I'm a white Afrikaans um, woman. <laughs> so um, we we literally would go at it and not in a negative way, but we we would dissect like all the things. Because that's happening. how you learn. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So she would tell me her background, her cultural context, and I would explain mine and we'd bounce ideas and try to fix the world just between the two of us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, then that's how it started. So by the time I got to the rest of the world, I had exercised a lot of muscles and like some things where you must kind of consider is it this like a, a what do they call it unconscious bias mm. or is it blatant racism or is it you know you you had to kind of figure it out and yeah. still and watch and also how much do you open your eyes to stuff and fight for it when there was like open still and watch etc or how much do you take a step back and you protect yourself and your mental health so i had to navigate that continuously in still and watch so by the time i got to um, all these organizations the embassies the international spaces such as the un water conference i went to 
And you kind of obviously feel like sometimes the global South is disadvantaged. I remember before going to the water conference, there was a group chat we were on and a lot of people from the global South Africa specifically, their visas were declined and it's young people. And there was no kind of justification, but I think it's the countries they came from, which were being um, profiled. So it's this whole thing and it's predominantly black people, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. So it's this whole idea now of it's this space we're going to find ourselves in, um, how we're going to navigate it, how we're going to form partnerships. So luckily, um, you, I went to an event with someone from the U.S. Embassy. So I, I asked for advice. So how do I go through the visa process? So I think networking and connections are very important. Mm. Even though sometimes, yes, you feel like the space is toxic or unfair and unjust, you you try and make the connections you can. Like the embassy or the Danish embassy I mentioned and the ambassador. I got a lot of advice from him um, during the time I was at the embassy. And I would ask him, what do you think about this? How can I approach this and enter these spaces as a young black woman? And that's where I would learn the muscles. So in those spaces where you feel like you're being brushed off or ignored, I would kind of build the confidence and go back and get feedback so that I was able to then kind of do it in, in other contexts as well. And, you know, we've spoken about us, you know, the youth and Mm -hmm. the challenges we face. I think we're in a very weird time. (laughs) I mean, everything that's going on in the world, um, they say... You know, they say we're lazy. We don't. Yep. We don't like working. <laughs> but actually, I feel like it's the opposite. We have all of these things that we're constantly um, being challenged with, and mm. we struggle to really find what what what's next. Like, where are we going? Mm-hmm. You know, the environment. Everything is. The world is in a in a very <laughs> very weird place. And like yeah. we said earlier, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Like, what is our purpose? We mm. are the youth. We are the future. What are we supposed to do? All this pressure. And what is your hope for us, the youth? And yeah. what what advice would you give to other people like me and you? No, you know, those yeah. two girls in rays wanting to change the world, wanting to make a difference. But we don't know where to start. And we don't know how are we going to navigate this path? Yeah. Um, I think going back to doing history, in history you learn that there were people before you. So I think that's what also gives me comfort sometimes is knowing that we're not the first to go through a crisis. Mm. Um, our parents, our grandparents, great-grandparents, ancestry lines, they went through a lot of crises and they were shocked by a lot of things like the first, fourth industrial, not the fourth, the actual industrial revolution, sorry. Oh, I didn't we even, are, I was just we are like in the nodding fourth. my head like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are actually going into the fourth, but yeah, when those transitions were happening, like manufacturing, slavery, like that's what I always say, like when you think of like all those other intense stuff, you realize that, okay, this is a crisis, but people have made it out alive. So I think that's the first thing I always try to comfort myself with. Mm. I hope it works for other people as well. It's just knowing that you're not the first to go through a crisis and you won't be the last mm. to go through a crisis. Like different um, generations, you know, after us are also going to go through different crises. And then secondly, I think it's also a good thing that we are cognizant of what we're going through because I think what's sad with um, the older generations is when they were in crisis mode, sometimes they didn't take care of themselves and their mental health and the implications of some of the choices and decisions they made. So now maybe broken families happened or, you know, people will call it um, black tax and all of those kind of consequences which happened that people now are looking back mm-hmm. on. And we can see the you know detrimental effects on our generation. And I know Twitter People call it black Twitter. But like people always are having discussions now and unpacking some of the traumas that they mm. are going through because of like their parents, etc. So I think sometimes I'm always just proud of our generation of being aware yeah. of what we're going through. So when we're looking at the LGBTQIA plus community and the challenges they're facing or racial challenges or gender challenges, we are cognizant of it's a mental health challenge mm. we are facing internally, but also we need to fix systematic issues Mm. so i think for looking at like the the hope i have for our generation moving from these crises is to number one be aware like stay cognizant and stay kind of in touch with ourselves and what's going on and trying to obviously we can't remove or eliminate Mm. impact um negative impact on the next generations will obviously be have like blind spots to some of the things we are doing but i think just be as cognizant as possible about the impact and actions 
you are kind of take getting involved in. And then I think secondly, it's um standing up for what you believe in. Mm. I think sometimes it's 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 small as, it's as small as writing a tweet or tagging someone in a post or being confident to speak to a friend about it and just put your thoughts out there and just kind of like you talked about unlearning and learn a lot be in the most uncomf- uncomfortable mm. positions you know put yourself out there and then also kind of to balance with that that whole knowledge it comes from like street knowledge and learning about things outside education as well kind of have some passion or qualification you can stand on we know this world is quite um harsh on people who are n- like who, do, who don't have certain level of qualification whether it's metric or um a diploma or um a degree so have some something to stand on and then i think also just kind of like be brave so i know there's a lot of like mo- youth movements which are like starting up now the i think it's futures for friday movement there is the rise movement i think it's a new political party which was launched recently like this week by the rivonia circle if i'm not mistaken there's people in political parties i think whichever space you can just kind of enter mm. so like for example your job and using media and broadcasting and journaling and i remember you also covered like a story um about me earlier on <laughs> like a couple of years ago yeah but like you use your platform to bring light to mm. issues so i think people shouldn't kind of undermine the roles they pay playing whether it's being an actress or you know in the creative arts or a scientist or whichever space you're in, make use of those tools and you can use, you know, your mural or portrait to put out an issue that you are passionate about and you can use um, your passion as a doctor and use your side, you know, channels yeah. and social medias to still advocate for issues as well. Sean, I think that's a beautiful note to end off on, like, back yourself. You know, yeah. we need to back ourselves. Like you said, bravery. We need to own who we are. We need to start <laughs> believing in ourselves and our power and be brave. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I always live by a quote by Oprah Winfrey. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't <laughs> think I remember it for line for line. But she says, always try to live by the fullest and truest expression of yourself. Sure. So that's what I always try to kind of align with. And the second one is Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, um, the, 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 arc of moral justice is long but it always bends towards justice so those are the two quotes i live by i always believe that even if it's not in my lifetime the 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 arc will bend towards justice and i'm just contributing to pushing mm. that bend and also just try and do it being the truest version of yourself whatever that means to you but also still respecting mm. you know the other people you live around thank you so much for joining me today our corner and Yo, once again, I'm in awe of you. You've always been such an inspiration to me. And thanks. Thank you for having me, Marley. Finally, we did it. Finally. (laughs) Cut. Yeah, that was good, guys. Awesome. All right, that was a great rehearsal. Let's do this thing for real. (laughs) This is Five.